practice during the entire lecture. There will be a slot for question after it. Um, you're all very, very welcome to participate in a discussion. For this, we ask you to raise your hands or post your question in the chat. You can either do it publicly or address me in a private message. I'm very happy to read your questions out loud. My name is Bettina Siegele, and I have now the pleasure in the name of the IARC to welcome Professor Jonathan Hill. Um, Jonathan Hill is Professor of Architecture and Visual Theory at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Um, he is author of various publications such as The Legal Architect from 1998, Actions of Architecture from 2003, Immaterial Architecture from 2006, Weather Architecture from 2012, A Landscape of Architecture, History and Fiction, published in 2016, and The Architecture of Ruins, published in 2019. He is the editor of Occupying Architecture, published 1998, Architecture of the Subject is Matter from 2001, and Designs and History, The Architect is Physical Historian from, I think it's going to be published this year, right? As well as the co-editor of Critical Architecture from 2007. This evening's lecture with the title The Architecture of Ruins, Designs on the Past, Present and Future, We'll discuss an alternative and significant history of architecture from the 16th century to the 21st in which a building is designed, occupied and imagined as a ruin. This design practice conceives a monument and a ruin as creative, interdependent and simultaneous themes with a single building dialectic, addressing temporal and environmental questions in poetic, psychological and practical terms and stimulating questions of personal and national identity nature and culture, weather and climate, permanence and impermanence, and life and death. Conceiving a building as a dialogue between a monument and a ruin intensifies the already blurred relations between the unfinished and the ruined, and emphasizes the past, the present, and the future in the yeah, same architecture. Yeah. Once again, I would like to remind everyone to unmute themselves. Thank you. And welcome once again, Jonathan, and Thank you for accepting this invitation. And with this, I will give the word to you now. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. So hopefully you can see that now, can you? Great. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. It's um, uh, very nice to be here, very nice to be invited to speak this evening. Um, and uh, as uh, it's been mentioned, uh, I'm gonna have, uh, I'm gonna talk, oh, sorry about that, about um, this book, which was the last book of mine to be published in, in 2019. Uh, and one of the things that's always interesting when you um, are choosing, uh, trying to sort of uh, establish the sort of fr framework for a book, uh, obviously one important uh, question is, image. Uh, and when I found this one, it was a very easy decision, really, because I think it sums up so much of my interest in the book. And it's actually when uh, Dennis Lasden, who is the architect of the National Theatre in London, uh, was actually designing the, the National Theatre, he had what he called in the corner of his office, the scrap heap, which was this pile of all the discarded models of the National Theatre. And it was something that um, the, the office was very proud of. Uh, and there are a number of photographs of Lasden and his partner standing in front of this. And of course, what it sort of indicates is that the ruin is part of a constructive design process. Uh, it's not something that just happens uh, after a building's out of use. It's actually part of the process of design and use. And many of the, the, the works that I uh, produce, many of the books are it, directly or incidentally, um, they relate to contemporary issues of climate change and uh, trying to frame that discussion in different ways. And the most obvious one of that is a book that I did um, about nine years ago now called Weather Architecture. But this book can also be seen in that way. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is to talk about a prehistory to some of those ideas, a prehistory to environmental discussions. And the way I frame that in this book is through the study of ruins. 
Uh, and many societies have conceived buildings as solidly stable and resistant to the weather, nature and time. But in this book, in my schema, a ruin is understood not only in terms of loss, failure, destruction and decay. Instead, identify an alternative history of architecture in which a building is designed, imagined and occupied as a ruin. So the ruin can be associated with all those stages of, of a building. And this design practice conceives a monument and a ruin as creative, interdependent and simultaneous themes within a single building dialectic, addressing temporal and environmental questions in poetic, psychological and practical terms and stimulating questions of personal and national identity, nature and culture, weather and climate, permanence and impermanence, life and death. And the book is actually structured around a collection of biographies because for an individual and notably for an architect, a monument and a ruin are metaphors for a life and a means to negotiate between a self and a society. And emphasizing the particular ways in which later architects have learned from earlier ones, I use the example of an evolving interdisciplinary practice to show the relevance of historical understanding to design. Now, this is obviously um, an engraving by Piranesi and the practices of the architect and the archeologist have been interdependent for centuries. Mirroring the need for precision in the sciences, early archeological investigations simulated demand for accurate drawings as a means to compile detailed records and aid comparative analysis within and between sites. And the most substantial structures, components and materials survived as ruins, while ephemeral materials subtle traces of use and specific qualities such as acoustics were less likely to remain, giving future generations a somewhat distorted image of the original structure and the life within it. And also crucially, an opportunity for the present to reinvent the past. Now the term ruin is actually derived from the Latin ruere, which means to fall or to collapse. But by the 18th century, its connotations were more complex and even positive, and I think this continues today. The concern for ruination came to fruition due to empirical science's detailed observation of life and death in plants and creatures, the attention to subjective experience and fragmented identity in the increasingly secular society, the heightened historical awareness in the Enlightenment's concern for origins and archeology, span and the value given to nature, time, and the imagination in the picturesque and romanticism. And in many ways, the ruin is a problem for the imagination. In surviving ancient ruins, conceiving archeology span as a stimulus to design, Andrea Palladio established and Giovanni Battista Piranesi expanded the practice of the archeologist arche architect. And in the 16th century, Palladio reconstructed a ruin as a building. But crucially, two centuries later, Piranesi constructed a building as a ruin. So it's an inversion of that process. And this uh, action of Piranesi's, I think, stimulated eight later architects to follow his model. And ruination, crucially, is evident in the method as well as the subject of Piranesi's engravings, as he innovatively combined engraving and etching with burnishing, rubbing, and scraping. Adios drawn reconstructions of ancient sites and inspired architects and patrons to reimagine ancient Roman architecture for a new era and a new setting. The desire to recall and even repeat Piranesi's sublime images led architects to conceive designs that referred not just to ancient Rome, but Piranesi's ancient Rome, creating their own versions of his dramatically ruined forms. Now, in 1770, uh, a visitor's description indicates that Piranesi's sensibility for fragments and ruins continued in his own home, which juxtaposed the numerous objects, books, images, antiquities, and artifacts of his domestic and working life. And this is a quotation from a visitor his, to his house. The house is really the most curious thing that ever was seen. I really wonder it does not tumble down. The landlord with great, good reason has entered a protest in case of accidents. So in a sense, Piranesi lived in a ruin as well as designed and engraved them. 
I was an architect Piranesi built little. Uh, and one of the things that always intrigued me is when you read uh, about Piranesi, obviously there's a huge amount of writing about his engravings. Uh, but his uh, one building that he was completed and one monument are sort of dismissed and dismissed as uninteresting and dismissed as unrelated to the engravings. And I found that obviously a, a challenge and intriguing. And I thought it was unlikely to be true. And I'm glad to say that it, it is untrue. Now in the Protestant cemetery in Rome, he designed the funerary monument to his friend, James MacDonald, who died of malaria in 1766, aged just 24. And the austere, austere monument consists of a square travertine plinth supporting a plain reused Roman column, which is encircled by two votive tablets with dovetail handles that form a projective stone base dividing, divided into two. And from a distance, the two halves of this uh, panel actually appear the same, but on close inspection, as you can see here, if you get up close, there is a clear hierarchy because one tablet contains the de dedication while the other is blank. And this is the little monument in its context. And the viewer obviously uh, stands in front of the side with the uh, inscription on it. And as you fa face this inscribed tablet, you see looming behind you, the ancient Roman pyramid of Gaius Cestius, which Piranesi incorporated into his design as a backdrop creating a dialogue between ideal forms and funerary monuments. A broken column to a broken life, the MacDonald Monument stands as a new ruin alongside an ancient ruin. Now, just uh, about a mile uh, from the little uh, Protestant cemetery, you walk up the hill and you come to Piranesi's really only completed uh, building and square. And the first thing you come across is the, this square. And Santa Maria della Priorato, which is this sort of, the, is the entrance to, uh, Santa, Santa Maria della Priorato is the church of the Knights of Malta in Rome, and also Piranesi's burials, burial site. And Piranesi also designed the expansive uh, entrance court, which is defined by high walls on three sides, suggesting an expectant empty stage. And rising high above the wall, massive commemorative obelisks emphasize Piranesi's fascination for the tombs that line, lined the Villa, Via Appia in ancient Rome. And it's quite an amazing space, this one. It only leads to one thing, which is the, the little monastery of the Knights of Malta. Now on entering the church, the visitor is drawn to the altar, uh, which you see ahead of you in this photograph. And that altar is illuminated by a large apse window behind the altar. And clear story windows also light the church, but the two bays closest to the altar are left blank to accept, accentuate the light from behind the apse window. And facing the congregation, the base of the altar consists of, a super, of superimposed forms reminiscent of ancient sarcophagi with a central elliptical oculus and reliefs depicting the Madonna and Lamb of God. And completing the composition, an upper sarcophagus supports an exuberantly sculptural depiction of St. Basil of Cappadocia, uh, drawn to heaven on a globe, surrounded by angels and putti. Now, when you get closer to that, you might see in the base there, that is where the, this oculus is. And you get closer to it, and this is what you see. And in Piranesi's preparatory drawings, they, uh, it's rather ambiguous because they alternatively uh, show the oculus as light or dark. And photographs depict the oculus as dark. Uh, and one of the things that I was very lucky that the, um, uh, I was allowed to spend quite a lot of time uh, to, to two visits to this um, little chapel. And I don't think I would have discovered what I did if I wasn't allowed to do that. And one of the things that's rather curious about it is that you, when you peer through the oculus, what is, uh, seems to be a black void actually you, you notice the glimmer of light. And this is actually a photograph inside the oculus. So rather amazingly, the oculus leads to a little chamber which goes all the way through, through the, uh, the altar. And it's a little low passage. <laughs> decorated with a Maltese cross that terminates in a lintel and an arch opening in the altar's rear elevation. Now, unfortunately today, a, a, a later organ blocks the arch window in the rear elevation. 
But if the organ was actually removed, light from the apse window would stream through this uh, little uh, oculus through the altar and illuminate uh, St. Basil so that he seemed to appearing to go to heaven. So if you imagine in this image, actually you wouldn't see a black oculus, you'd see a brightly illuminated one. So uh, the whole structure was floating up to heaven. Now the strong east light obviously invites the viewer. If you see there, you can sort of see that the light is drawing you to rather surprisingly go behind the altar. And the altar is actually kept forward of the apse so that it's, it's very clear that you're expected to do that. And as you actually come round to the back uh, of the uh, altar, um, the one person who's really written about this at all is Manfredo Tofori. And Manfro uh, Manfredo Tofori says this, he says that Piranesi does not take sides, but offers instead an agonizing dialectic. And in juxtaposition to the public front of the altar, which is encrusted with figures and seen in silhouette and shadow, the apse window brightly illuminates the rear of the altar, revealing the pure monumental globe resting on the equally bare sarcophagus and stepped drum. And studied close up from the sides, the stucco decoration seems to continue around the altar. And the extent of Piranesi's innovation is only apparent when the altar is seen fully from the rear in the direction of the light, as though the sun had blanched the stucco ornamentation and rendered the forms abstract. But the ornamentation does not stop consistently. At the top of the altar, the figures of St. Basil, the angels and the putti are sculpted in equal detail on all sides. And the globe is bare and the ornamentation stops sharply on the upper sarcophagus so that its rear face is blank, as you can see here. But if you look actually around the base, you see that the sequential layers of stucco ornamentation on the step drum do not stop suddenly in a hard vertical line, but come to a halt in differing ways. Some cease abruptly, while others break off in mid-sentence or peter out gradually. And the lines inscribed in the altar's monochromatic stucco surface recall those that Piranesi incised into metal and printed on paper. The altar is ambiguous and open to imaginative interpretation. And that's a crucial thing about the ruin. The ruin is always open to imaginative interpretation. It's broken because it's asking us to complete it in our imagination. And this altar, I'd say, was asked, asked, asked us whether it is nurtured or bleached by the light, sculpted or etched, unfinished or ruined. This is another image of that uh, altar. And Piranesi's principal influence is due to the ruins he engraved, not the publications he authored, the objects he restored, or the structures he designed. But understanding his work collectively, I think it is possible to see scalar and thematic connections between the illusion of entirety in a restored object, the juxtaposition of reconfigures, uh, reconfigured structures in a new plan of old Rome, the accumulation of fragments in a publication dedicated to the imagination, and the dialogue between emblematic, unfinished, abstract, and uh, absent elements in a building. Both completed in 1766, Santa Maria and the McDonald Monument literally build on themes evident in his engravings. And Piranesi suggests that the whole is a ruin, even if the forms are complete, and implies a design strategy that combines ruination and construction, composed and fractured spatial relations broken remains and entire forms. And Piranesi concludes that a monumental ruin exemplifies the majesty and emotive power of architecture more eloquently even than a complete building, because it indicates not only the destructive force of nature, but also the endurance of ancient forms, which are depicted as broken and denied of absolute authority, and thus a greater stimulus to the imagination. Now, acknowledging the support and appreciation he received from British architects and patrons, Piranesi remarked that if he lived outside Italy, he would have chosen London. And his closest British associate was the Scottish architect, Robert Adam, who was a young architect on the grand tour in Rome when he met Piranesi, who was much older. And indicating, uh, Piranesi indicated his respect uh, by actually dedicating one of his most famous drawings, the Inigraphia, which is a monumental master plan, 
in the Campo Marzio del Antica, uh, Roma uh, from 1762. And he actually dedicated this to Robert Adam. And you can see there top left, the reference to Adam. And depicting a city of juxtaposed monumental forms, a Pyrenees' Campo Marzio is an imaginary construction of past Rome, a critique of present Rome and a proposition for a future Rome. This is actually a drawing by Robert Adam. Uh, and when uh, Adam was in Rome, he prepared numerous designs for ruins, including a large colored design of an open uh, rotunda, which combines ruined and internal rooms within one structure. And leaving Rome in May 15, uh, 1757, Adam was determined to undertake a substantial archeological project before he returned to Britain. And he selected the Emperor Diocletian's palace on the Dalmatian coast. And in comparative engravings, the same elevation is depicted in reconstructed and ruined states, one above the other on a single plate as here in the south wall of the palace. And importantly, both of these are creative interpretations shown without the later structures then on the site. And it implies that these two uh, drawings, the reconstruction and the ruin, in both instances presented without a setting, can be understood as designs ready to be translated to a new context. And visiting many of the sites that Adam had seen 20 years earlier, John Soane met Piranesi in the summer of 1778, shortly before the Venetian's death in November that year. And he no doubt admired Piranesi's compelling fusion of home, studio and museum. And appreciating a new talented pupil, Piranesi gave Soane four engraved views of the ancient monuments and ruins. A great admirer of Adam, as well as Piranesi, Soane later purchased the multi-volume drawing collection of Robert and James Adam, which included numerous designs for ruins. And Soane is emblematic of the principle that creative architectural development occurs through the interdependence of drawing, writing and building past as well as influencing the future. And this is actually one of the paintings that uh, his assistant and pupil Gandhi did of Soane's works. And it's actually a collection of all Soane's completed projects, but they're rather, they are, there's an ambiguity about whether they're models uh, or actual real buildings, because obviously they are depicted in a domestic set, setting. And rather curiously, if you look uh, on one level, you might sort of think there's one scale that they might be the scale of a model. Another one, you might scale it's a scale of a building. Another might, you might scale it, think, assume it's the scale of a room. And if you look right to the bottom right, you see this little tiny figure working at a, at a desk, which was presumably a reference to Soane. Now, this idea of a design as a portrait, as an autobiography, I think has parallels in literature. Uh, and many of one of the things I'm interested in is that many of the forms that we use today, the genres we think of as so familiar to us, actually have a more recent history. And obviously people have written about themselves for millennia, but the formation of modern identity in the 18th century is associated with a type of diary writing that Michel Foucault rather beautifully describes as a technology of the self, which is the process of self-examination by which moral character and behavior are constructed and reimagined. Now, objectivity may be an aspiration, but no diary is entirely truthful, and the diarist cannot fail to edit and reinvent life while reflecting upon it, altering the past as well as influencing the future. And I would argue that equivalent to a visual and spatial diary, the process of design from one drawing to the next iteration and from one project to another is itself an autobiographical technology of the self formulating a design ethos for an individual or for a studio. And I think Soane's work describes this and illustrates this very well. This is actually an image from uh, Soane's uh, picture room at Lincoln's in Fields. And derived from the ancient Greek term for experience, the principal British contribution to 18th century enlightenment theory was empiricism, which made reason specific rather than generic. An empirical investigation was applied extensively, notably to the natural world and the operations of the mind. And leading empiricists 
emphasize the importance of maintaining a diary, placing great emphasis on empirical methods that led to personal development. And obviously Soane's museum, house and office can be seen as itself a diary, a portrait or, or an autobiography. And alongside the developed diary, uh, and these early diaries might be called autobiographical fictions, uh, another new literary genre developed, the early novel, which can be described as a fictional autobiography. And the actual origin of the, the novel is disputed. Uh, you might say one possibility is from 11th century Japan. In Europe, the, the most early example is probably Cervantes' uh, 17th century novel, Don Quixote. But often the uh, origin of the novel as we understand it today is associated with uh, early 18th century England. And in valuing direct experience, precise description, and a skeptical approach to facts, which needs to be repeatedly questioned, the empirical method created a fruitful climate in which the everyday realism of a new literary genre, the novel, could prosper as factual fiction. And that's a rather lovely phrase from Leonard Davis. It's a phrase that he uses to describe the novel, but it's also a phrase I think we could use to describe architecture. And architecture is, of course, and design is a sort of form of factual fiction. Now, the uncertainties and dilemmas of personal identity in a vibrant secular society were ripe for narrative account. And notably, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe from 1719 is often described as the first English novel, and it is a fictional autobiography. And Defoe describes another novel from uh, another novel of his, Small Flanders from 1722, as a private history. And he calls another novel, Roxana from 1724, as laid in truth of fact, and thus not a story, but a history. And that's a claim that's echoed by other novelists throughout the 18th century. Even uh, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels from 1726 is presented as true. And the frontispiece depicts uh, Lemuel Gulliver, a ship's surgeon and captain, who claims to verify his story in a number of ways, including uh, a reference to the uh, stingers of three gigantic wasps, which he teasingly claims to have given to the first home of the Royal Society, which is the principal institution of British science. So in a way, uh, Swift was using uh, his uh, empirical method while also mocking it. And history's uncertain and evolving status supported authors' claims that the first novels were in fact histories. In the 16th century, history's purpose was to offer useful lessons and accuracy was not necessary. But in subsequent centuries, Pearson's emphasis on the distinction between fact and fiction began to transform historical analysis. But this transition was slow and most 18th century histories inherited some of the rhetorical approach of earlier histories, implying that the truth does not depend on facts alone. So we could say that the 18th century stimulated the simultaneous and interdependent emergence of new art forms, each of them a creative and questioning response to empiricism's detailed investigation of subjective experience in the natural world, namely the novel, the analytical history, and the picturesque landscape. And I'd argue that the picturesque landscape is equivalent to a history, formulating an interpretation of the past in the present through classical reconstructions, antique sculptures, and important trees. Equally, the picturesque landscape is equivalent to a fiction, triggering fractured narratives, unexpected digressions, and creative reflections on identity and society. And there is a further parallel between the architect blurring archaeology, uh, employing archaeology to blur reconstruction and design, and the novelist pretending to have discovered an authentic story. And the conjunction of new art forms simulated a new design practice and a lyrical environmentalism that profoundly influenced subsequent centuries. Now you might wonder why I'm using this argument. Uh, I'm using an image from the Soane uh, House and Museum to pick this argument. And it's because Soane often stated his fascination for the picturesque. In discussing a building and its setting, he writes, and this is a quote, architecture being thus identified with gardening, it becomes a necessary part of the education of the architect that he should be well acquainted 
with the principles of modern landscape gardening. But I think his comparison of a building to a garden went further because Soane conceived Lincoln's Inn Fields as a garden of architecture. And maybe this image shows it. This is actually the museum, one of the uh, images of the dome area in the museum at Lincoln's Inn Fields. And you see Soane's bust at the center. And we can look at this obviously as architecture. I think we can also look at it as an architectural garden. An avid for acquisition and adjustment, Soane's inquisitive imagination guaranteed seasonal and yearly transformations. Sculptures and antiquities cover every surface like architectural foliage, recalling the shaggy aesthetic of the late 18th century picturesque, where alternative routes and intricately interconnected spaces are reminiscent of the early 18th century picturesque. The house actually sort of focuses, it's very internal when you reside it, and it sort of focuses on this particular little courtyard, the Monument Court, and which is, uh, um, concerned to engender wonder as well as discourse, Soane noted the creative influence of climate and weather. And beyond the city, he enjoyed the shifting modulations of mist and light. But in London, he concluded that retreat was the appropriate response to the city's contaminated air. And it's hard for us to imagine uh, what the air of an industrial city like that was. But to give you some idea of it, I'm going to mention that Coles then had sulfur levels twice that of ones used centuries later. And on combustion, sulfur oxidized to introduce sulfur dioxide into the air. And a secondary oxidation actually created sulfuric acid. So that fog, coal smoke, and industrial fumes turned the air sky into a darkly odorous smog, corroding uh, metals, blackening buildings, killing plants, lodging in eyes, throats, and lungs, and making streets and squares unbearable, and actually meant that rain contained diluted sulfuric acid. Now, designing a, a climate as well as a garden, Soane employed an invention of the industrial era, a central heating, to render his garden habitable and exclude a byproduct of industrialization, namely intense pollution. And inserted color, inserting colored glass skylights and innumerable reflected surfaces, he bathed his garden in the golden light of Rome. But like his friend, the painter J.M.W. Turner, Soane appreciated the malign external climate he observed, as well as the benign internal uh, climate he fabricated. And the front facade of 12 to 14 Lincoln's and Fields faces the square. But as I've mentioned, the principal focus is internal. And many of the significant rooms of Soane's private and professional life gather around this space, the Monument Court, which includes the composite column reminiscent of Piranesi. Uh, and if you go to the Soane Museum, those of you who have, you'll notice the use of colored glass and yellow glass and amber glass in many of the places of the, the museum. And there's a little tiny space, a little corridor, not much more than a corridor, where Soane worked. Uh, and although Soane uh, actually um, color, used colored glass in many spaces, he did not roof the monument court in glass and all the windows onto it have clear glass, including the only window in the little study where he worked every day. And as the monument court was exposed to London's ruinous uh, corroding pollution, it is likely that Soane appreciated the contrasting internal and external climates, observing a sublime shadow of soot accumulating on monuments and ruins. This is actually the breakfast room of uh, the Soane Museum. And I think when you, if any of you have been there, you have to sort of think that it's what you experience today is very different to what the, the building would have been like in uh, its lifetime. Because in a way, Soane used the, 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 uh, his house office and museum as a test bed. Uh, and the building was actually a building site for over 40 years. And so was always changing and moving and adding and reconstructing. And so conceived 12 to 14 Lincoln's in fields as a ruin and ruined as much as he built. Remaining in Lincoln's in fields while the three adjacent buildings were acquired, demolished, constructed and ruined. Soan designed a living ruin. And if you look uh, in this, this is actually the breakfast room. You see above there, you see uh, above the bookshelf, there's a wind uh, sculpture of victory 
And behind that is actually a, a painting, a watercolor of Soane's uh, tomb. And Soane's tomb is about a mile from his house. Uh, and it's a very pristine little building. Um, and it contains just his family tomb. And intriguingly, he actually described his family tomb as his eternal home. And he characterized 12 to 14 Lincolns in fields as his temporary home. Incorporating only new elements, his eternal home was designed as a pristine and immutable monument. And in contrast, he conceived his temporary home, his house, his office, his museum, as a monument to a ruin, incorporating found and fabricated elements so that it was representative of time as well as the timeless. And alongside familiar associations with death and decay, Sohn also conceived the ruin as synonymous with the creativity of life. And it's an important to bear in mind that that's how Sohn actually conceived the ruin. So often we see the ruin as a metaphor for death and decay, but he conceived it as synonymous with creativity, with transformation, with change, with potential, as well as with loss. And as I mentioned, I think Soane is emblematic of the fact that architects, certainly in the Renaissance, had, they don't just build, they, have, no, they write and draw as much as they build. And Soane's obsession with personal and architectural ruination stimulated him to write uh, a, a novelistic, uh, this is a title, uh, a little history. And the title of that history was Crude Hints Towards a History of My House in Lincoln's Inn Fields. And he did that intriguingly in 1812, during a significant period of building work, as one house was demolished and a new one constructed. And so in this uh, novelistic history, he actually imagines that his home is first occupied and then left to decay. Assumed to be haunted, the house has no visitors until a future antiquarian, on finding it in ruins, attempts to decipher its earlier purpose and character. And one part of the house yeah, so and actually equates to one of those, what he calls dark staircases represented in some of Pyrenees' ingenious carcere, which is one of uh, uh, Soane's set of engravings. And uh, in this sort of novelistic history, the, the character of the antiquarian, who is in a sense a narrator, uh, speculates on, he says, the great antiquity of this design. And he notes that some people assume that the ruin was once a temple or the residence of some magician. But the antiquarian concludes that it was ho the home of an architect intended for the advancement and knowledge of, art, of ancient arts to exemplify changes in architecture and to lay the foundation of a history of the art itself. Now, crude hints is intriguing uh, because it creates, it obviously, it actually offers three alternative versions of a downcast conclusion emphasizing uh, Soane's failure to establish an architectural dynasty. And the final version even assumes that Lincoln's Inn Fields has fallen into neglect, neglect as early as 1830, just about 18 years after it was constructed. But crude hints is not only melancholy. And mirroring the experimental design process at 12 to 14 Lincoln's Inn Fields, crude hints is a specul speculation on future constructions as well as on future ruins. And it blurs the two, importantly. Intrigued by a building's finished state, Soane required his pupils to, furnish, to further the education by drawing his buildings under construction. And demolition is essential to construction. And construction sites, as we all know, often appear ruinous. Like building sites, I'd argue that ruins are full of potential. Now, as Soane imagined his new designs, he was literally surrounded by the ruins of the past in the fragments, models, and drawings of his extensive collection. And referring to the architecture of classical antiquity, he remarks, this is a quote, the, those monuments of human talents that have never been inkled, and these ruins should be the first object of our consideration and the basis of our taste. Now, one possible interpretation of this statement is to assume that Soane advocated the study of ancient ruins so that modern reconstructions could acknowledge the past and inventively respond to new conditions. But I think this was only partly his intention. 
Soane's further purpose was to model contemporary buildings on ancient ruins, just as Piranesi had done. And this is actually Joseph Gandhi's 1799 watercolor of Soane's Bank of England. And it, this is actually a, a watercolor that shows probably Soane's most important commission uh, under construction. And it shows the Bank of England uh, with its walls without plaster and the dome constructed up to the base of the lantern. The bank is seen not as a ruin, but as a building inspired by a ruin, open to the elements and without further signs of decay. And alongside a debt to ruined forms, Gandhi's watercolor indicates innovative construction because so experimented with new top technologies so that the bank was robust and fireproof. And this is a rather beautiful quote from Soane I'm going to read. If artificial ruins of rocks and buildings are so cunningly contrived, so well conceived as to excite such reflections that they can be considered as ruins open to all the world. Now, I think what Son is doing here is that in describing a design as a, uh, as a, hi a history, as a design ruin, he emphasizes that a history is also a reinterpretation of the past in the present and is never neutral and always partial. This is once again uh, Lasden's beautiful scrap heap. And architects have used history in different ways, whether to indicate their continuity with the past or their departure from it. From the Renaissance to the early 20th century, the architect was a historian in the sense that an architectural treatise combined drawings and words to consider relations between the past and the present. And a building was expected to manifest the character of the time and knowingly critique earlier historical eras. Now, modernism ruptured this system in principle, if not always in practice, and advocating an architecture specific to the present and discarding previous educational models, Gropius famously excluded the history of architecture from the Bauhaus syllabus. But even modernists who denied the relevance of the past relied on histories to validate modernism and articulate its principles. Books such as Nicholas Pevsner's Pioneers of the Modern Movement from 1936 identify a modernist prehistory to justify modernism historical inevitability, break from the past and systematic evolution. And in the uncertain post-war aftermath of 1945, modernism's previously dismissive reaction to social norms and cultural memory, memories became anachronistic. And the Second World War was a more scientific war than the first, undermining confidence in technological progress as a means of social transformation, crucially for the generation of architects who had seen military service. And uh, in the 1960s, Dennis Lasden, who, who created this uh, scrap heap, that each architect must devise his or her own creative myth. And what, by creative myth, he means a collection of ideas, values, and forms that stimulate and frame design. And he concluded, he said, my own myth engages with history. And in a similar vein, in 1969, Vincent Scully stated this, and this is a quotation. The architect will always be dealing with historical problems with the past and a function of the past with the future. So the architect should be regarded as a kind of physical historian. The architect builds visible history. From that, I would argue that the architect is a historian twice over, as does a designer of buildings and as an author of books. And celebrating ruination as a necessary and creative aspect of the design process and the life of building, Lasman appreciated this beautiful monumental scrap heap of discarded National Theatre models in his London studio. And he recalled it the evolving assemblage in a series of photographs that of course recall, recall Gandhi's paintings of Soane's built and unbuilt projects. And if you look at that image and you look at this one, you understand that the direct reference I think that Lasden was making. Now, early modernists had little concern for the ruin, preferring the emptiness of the tabula rasa. 
But in the post-war era, the return of history meant the return of the ruin. Rather than consistent, this concern varied according to national histories, philosophies, and needs. An obsession with progress has often led America to misunderstand ruins, identifying them only with regressive nostalgia. And Louis Sullivan reportedly quipped, if you live long enough, you'll see all your buildings destroyed. Now, the independence of the monument and the ruin, which came to define Louis Kahn's post-war design development, was a critique of obsolescence and expendability. And it may also be a warning to America's imperial ambitions. And Kahn, this is obviously Kahn's Salk Institute in La Jolla in San Diego, and Kahn characterized his design strategy as, uh, in a, me a very memorable phrase, wrapping ruins round buildings. As much as ancient ruin itself, Kahn's inspiration was the ruined city reimagined by Piranesi. And in the 1960s, he actually placed a copy of this drawing, uh, the Inigraphia. He actually placed a, a Piranesi Inigraphia on the wall in front of his desk. And that image actually remained there throughout the, le the rest of the time of Kahn's career. But unlike Piranesi, Kahn did not imagine his designed ruins aging, weathering, and overgrown with vegetation. Paradoxically, Kahn adopted a form associated with time, namely the ruin, but wanted it to be timeless and thus a measure of our impermanence, remarking how accidental our existences are, really. And recalling Robert Smithson's 1967 phrase, Alison Smithson remarked in 1976 that a building under, under assembly is like a ruin in reverse. And obviously the process of ruination begins the day that a construct, the construction workers first experience a ruin in re reverse and continues while this building is in use and develops further once it is no longer inhabited, becoming a ruin in advance. And this is actually a uh, an image of the construction of Alison and Peter Smithson's 1972 housing project, Robin Hood Gardens. And it focuses on two mounds that you can see are being uh, built. And they are actually formed from the rubble of demolished buildings found on the site. And the sparse conical forms are reminiscent of ancient burial mounds and prophetically allude to Robin Hood Gardens' present day rumination as a victim of a a regeneration in London. Uh, when I was researching for this book, one of the most beautiful uh, books I've read by an architect is uh, Irata Isasaki's book, Japanness, uh, which the original version of the uh, draft of that was actually going to be called The Ruin of Styles. And I think it's a really uh, fascinating example of a, an architect talking about his work and uh, locating it historically. And the destruction of the Second World War was most uh, apocalyptic in a nation where the traditional Western conception of architecture and the dialectic between a monument or ruin was itself an imposition. And citing Piranesi's influence, Isasaki remarked, this is a quote, much of our aesthetics of ruins goes back to the visionaries of the 18th century. Now, traditional Japanese philosophy has no equivalent to the Western notion of lasting ruins. But Isasaki notes that other concepts of ruin are evident, which in contemporary Japan exist alongside and in combination with the Western understanding of ruins. And rather than being specific to a time and a place, Isasaki ruin, uh, argues that ruins are what he calls architecture's general characteristic. And this is a quote from Isasaki that I will now read. From the moment the constructions I participate in are completed, they begin their journey on the road to ruin, just as living things move onto their, onto their death. Indeed, from the moment a building is conceived in the thought of itself, it already includes its own decay. But he's not just sort of seeing a building as in the initiating decay, he actually sort of sees it as starting with a drawing. And he also sees change and ruin combined in uh, the design process. And he emphasizes a cyclical conception of time and concludes, and this is his quote again, 
Since change is half destructive and half constructive, it should be permissible for architecture to create the exact appearance of ruins. And to um, conclude this talk, I'm going to try to draw some of these ideas together. And a monument may be celebratory or recall a traumatic event, but it is more often dialectical, indicating what we choose to remember as well as what we choose to forget. And the etymology of the term monument refers to the Latin monumentum, which in turn derives from an area, meaning to remind, warn and advise. Therefore, a monument's purpose is complex and questioning and not merely commemorative. And its original meanings are soon transformed, obscured or forgotten, unless they are continuously recalled and reaffirmed through everyday or ritualistic behavior, which are as necessary to perpetuating collective memory as well as, uh, as any material object. And this is actually Dennis Lassen's University of Sanglia. And this is that building under construction. Now I'd argue as a ruin, architecture is more, not less. As a stimulus to the imagination, a ruin's incomplete and broken forms expand architecture's allegorical and metaphorical potential. And emphasizing that meanings are not fixed, but open to adaptation and reinvention. A fragmented work is a truer reflection of contemporary identity than a complete one indicating that a work of art or architecture or literature can remain unfinished, literally and in the imagination, focusing attention on the creative role of viewers, readers and viewers, sorry, viewers, readers and users, as well as that of artists, writers and architects. Now, as a means to contemplate time, ruin is an image of the future as well as an image of the past encouraging us to imagine not only what is lost, but also what is incomplete and what is yet to occur. And rather than confined to the past, the ideas and forms discovered in a ruin can be seen as incomplete and open to future development. Next, as a model for architectural env environmentalism, a ruin establishes symbiotic relations with its ever-changing immediate and wider context celebrating the creative influence of natural and cultural forces and recognizing the co-production of multiple authors, whether human, non-human or atmospheric, a designed ruin is an appropriate model for architecture in an era of increasing climate change. Now a ruin is typically understood to be an edifice that is no longer in use, but ruination does not only occur once a building is without a function, Instead, it is a continuing process that develops at differing speeds in differing spaces while a building is still occupied, assembled from materials of diverse ages, from the newly found to those centuries or more old. A building incorporates varied rates and states of transformation. Weather and pollutants undermine structures, plants and insects enlarge fissures and cracks, building materials react to each other, and people adjust or abandon structures and spaces. Fluctuating according to the needs of specific spaces and components, maintenance and repair may halt ruination or delay it somewhat, while accepting and accommodating partial ruination can, can question the recurring cycles of production, obsolescence and waste that feed consumption in a capitalist society. The architectural equivalent of junk food much present day architecture is disposable. In contrast, conceiving a building as a monument to ruin is positively paradoxical in that it should be built of durable materials, emphasizing longevity and not obsolescence. Now the inevitability of death can induce either lethargy or stimulate ingenuity in every living moment. In the stoic grandeur of an ancient ruin, decay occurred in the distant past, stimulating general thoughts of degradation and renewal that allow us to contemplate life and assume that death is reassuring in the future. But in a modern ruin, active decay occurs before our eyes, stimulating particularly disturbing thoughts of our imminent generation demise. 
and all ruins represent potential as well as loss. But a building on a, a ruin, building modeled on a ruin, rebalance this debate so that it's synonymous with the creativity and the vulnerability and, of life. And conceiving a building as a dialogue between a monument and a ruin, which may fall into ruin, rise into built form, or oscillate between the two, intensifies the already blurred relations between the unfinished and the ruin. Now, creative architects have often looked to the past to imagine the future, studying an early architecture, not to replicate it, but to transform it. And in many eras, the most fruitful architectural innovations have occurred when ideas and forms have migrated from one time and place to another by a process of translation that has proved to be as stimulating and inventive as the initial conception. Thus a design can be understood as specific to a time and a place and a compound of other times and places. And I would argue that 21st century architects need to appreciate the shock of the old as well as the shock of the new. And to ask what is new involves other questions, why it is new, how it is new and where is it new. And to understand what is new, we need to consider the present, the past, and maybe even the future. We need to think historically. Design, defining something as new is an inherent historical act because it requires an awareness of what is old. And a concern, concern for innovation need not reject or negate the past. And sometimes the old is more radical than the new. And from that, I would sort of, to put that into a sort of context, I'd argue that the architect is a physical novelist as well as a physical historian. And histories and novels both need to be convincing in different ways. Although no history is completely objective, to have any validity, it must be truthful to the past. A novel, however, may be believable, not true. And like a, a history, a design is a reinterpretation of the past that is meaningful to the present. Equally, a design is equivalent to a fiction, convincing users to suspend disbelief. We expect a history or a novel to be written in words, but they can also be delineated in drawing, cast in concrete or seeded in soil. And laying bare the processes of construction and decay, a history is a ruin, a ruin of the past and a reconstruction in the present. Equally, the novel's origins in the fictional biography ensures that a life in ruins is a recurring literary metaphor representing potential as well as loss. Now, some architects conceive a design for the present, some imagine for a mythical past, while others desire, uh, create for a future time and place. But conceiving a building as simultaneously old and new, a history and a novel, a monument and a ruin, envisages, envisages the past, the present, and the future in a single architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. We already received the first questions via the YouTube stream we have running beside it. Um, I will just read it out loud. What is the very role of the fragment inside of the ruin? Should it be seen as a microcosmos by itself? Um, there's a very obviously interesting relationship between uh, ruins and fragmentation. They, they sort of overlap. Uh, and I think that one of the things that's interesting about fragmentation is uh, you could say that the, that the ruin appears in many literary forms, but also the fragment does as well, the discussions of the fragments. And um, I would say one's not inside the other, I'd say they overlap with each other. Thank you. Um, another question from the audio audience. Um, how would you define the difference between weathering and ruination? Uh, ruination, I'd say weathering could be one of the causes of ruination. Obviously, ruinations are much bigger, uh, um, and weather's a big subject in its own right, but there are many types of ruination. Um, one of the obvious is 9-11. Um, uh, we think about the destruction of the Twin Towers. That's obviously a very uh, human act not uh, an act of weathering. Weathering also, I think it's important to bear in mind that weathering in itself is most often a hybrid of um, our actions and those of the atmosphere. 
because um, sometimes the weather is, is uh, human induced, is anthropogenic. It's partly it's made by us, partly it's made by cows, partly it's made by the atmosphere. So um, weather is one cause of ruination, I'd say, not the only one. Thank you. Just so many questions in the chat, it's lovely. Um, the next one is from, from Giacomo actually. He's asking, how is Piranesi's Campo Marzo a, a vision of futures Rome? Wasn't it an attempt of representing ancient Rome as Piranesi describes the word and also quite a common practice in those times, also thinking of people such as Juvara, Van Erlach or Carlo Fontana? Um, well, the, the Campo Marzio was an image of, it was an argument for a certain type of architecture. It was an argument for, uh, it was a reference to um, ancient Rome. Obviously he was sort of trying to, he, he did a lot of um, archeological uh, visits to Hadrian's Villa and he tried to sort of understand those buildings. But also Campo Marzio, is both his interpretation of ancient Rome, but it is a design. It's a design for a, a, a future Rome. Uh, and it's often seen as a critique of uh, Nolly's plan of Rome, which is you know, in which the sort of, uh, the, the buildings sort of absorbed into the streets. And it's, a, it's an argument for uh, an architecture which involves in uh, monumental juxtaposition. Um, the next one, I'm sorry if you're bombarding you with too many questions, <laughs> please <say stop. laughs> um, It's coming from, from Gonzalo, actually. Um, he's asking if there is any difference between an authentic act of design, designing a ruin, a lausanne, or if there is something like a kitsch ruin in, in regard to thematic fun parks, for example. Can you say that last, last bit of the sentence? Sorry, just repeat that. Um, if there is an authentic act of designing a ruin like son or if something like a kitsch ruin, kitsch ruin meaning like fun parks. Yeah, I think so. And I, th I think they can blur sometimes. I mean, it's one of the things that Sohn actually wrote about it. And he said that uh, a, son, a, a ruin to convince us uh, must be believable. And, you know, if you go to, um, one of the things that's very interesting about like the, the, the monument that I showed in the monument court, it's actually constructed of, of found elements. Uh, Soane was also clerk of works to the rebuilding of uh, Westminster Abbey and Whitehall at the time. And he actually took uh, fragments from there and made those, incorporated them into his house. So I think that a ruin, um, I'd say a ruin is kitsch if it's not belie believable. Uh, and if, if we obviously know it's a pastiche, and certainly it's one of the things that um, Soane was very interested in, and you see that in also in Kahn's work, you know, you see the sort of absolute attention to the monumentality of materials. Um, again, one from the YouTube chat. Uh, would you say that there is a relation between the use of the idea of ruin in architectural design and the ecological crisis we face? Could it be used in the sphere of reconciliating ecology? Yes, I suppose. Um, I mean, I mean, interestingly, I'm uh, the. Uh, it, I'd say that's definitely a theme of uh, the architectural ruins. It's now a, a stronger theme of uh, a book I'm working on. Um, I'm working on an edited book, which is actually called "Designs on History: The Arch The Architect of Physical Historian," that will come out later this year. And then I'm working on an authored book. Uh, and one of the things that author book is going to talk about is much more the, the possibilities of the ruin as a, a model for dealing with climate change. Uh, and in a sense, it's, um, it's really an idea of living with change. Um, one of the things that um, in the seminar we were sort of talking about in the last couple of days that I find is that um, Scientists only really recognized anthropogenic climate change in the 1970s. But there is a longer, much longer tradition in art, architecture and literature of uh, understanding environmental change. And I think that sometimes um, we, we sort of talk about, um, in contemporary culture, we talk about climate change as a problem to be solved. Uh, and actually to some degree, obviously we have to try to solve it where we can. 
but also maybe as important is living with climate change. And it's something that we have to accept that climate change to some extent is not gonna suddenly stop. Climate always changes. And so the, um, the ruin and the idea of a design ruin is uh, a model for that because maybe we have to sometimes accept decay. Maybe we don't sow something away. Maybe we have to reuse it. Maybe have to, we have to accept, accept its decayed state and see that as potential, not as something that needs to be discarded. And then um, another one from the YouTube chat. We have a quite thoughtful audience there. Do you think that there is a direct link between ruination and loss of memory, collective memory? Can one be a direct cause of the other? I, I think it's a very interesting question, actually. Um, I do talk, talk about memory quite a lot in the book. And obviously, um, the ruin has often been used as uh, uh, an analogous to, me to the memory. And sometimes, of course, um, memory is ad uh, forgetting something can be advantageous, particularly if it's traumatic. Sometimes it allows you to move on. It sort of allows you to move forward. Uh, and I, I do think there is a very interesting debate about um, the role of memory in architecture now. You know, obviously at a certain, uh, one, architecture is one of the tools by which we remember. It's also one of the tools by which we forget. But I think one of the uh, things that's happening at the moment is that um, a lot of our mnemonic function a lot of the, um, our attempt to remember, we're, we're actually giving over to uh, iPhones, to personal communication devices. And maybe that's actually diminishing our own role, uh, our own ability to remember. And I think that I sometimes would describe the, the world in which we live in, of the internet, as a perpetual present. Everything is treated as though it's equal and equally present. And I think that's even more apparent at the moment when many of us are in lockdown and only communicating each other online. So I think the, the relationship between memory and the ruin is a very, very interesting one, very rich. Indeed, yes. Um, Florina is wondering um, if the profile of the architect archaeologist as were Palladio Piranesi is still valid today? Uh, I, I think so, very much so. Um, one of the things that I suppose I'm interested in is that I feel the professionalization of architecture has not necessarily been beneficial to architects and not necessarily beneficial to architecture. And, you know, there's many discussions of... Uh, in the, the, we have more and more discussions about the virtues of interdisciplinary practice, interdisciplinary research. But the interesting thing is that in many ways in the 18th century, architects were more interdisciplinary than they uh, are today. And the Piranesi is taught in um, archeology span programs. He's not just taught in, in, in architecture programs. And I think that the, the skills, I would say, of the archaeologist are really uh, useful to the architect. I say there are many other interdisciplinary skills, and maybe the architect needs to become a bit more of an interdisciplinarian again. Um, Tim Altenhof addressed with the question, by completing a building, its inherent idea is often being concealed. Do you think that ruination helps to lay bare the essence of a building and could one capitalize on this effect? Yes, I, I think that's very true. And I think that's one of the things that um, you very much see in uh, Piranesi's engravings because Piranesi, for example, was very interested in construction. And often when he shows a building in ruination, actually what he's doing is he's revealing how it's constructed. He, he, you know, many of the, the processes of construction which are concealed in a final building, they're actually exposed by uh, ru ru ruination. So yes, I would agree. And again, from the YouTube chat, um, do you think the concrete skeleton ruins left by the financial crisis will be reflected upon, a, upon as being of an historical significance? Could you say that question again, so just so I get it correctly? 
Do you think the concrete skeletons, ruins left by the financial crisis will be reflected upon as being of any historical significance? The ruins of the financial crisis? Yes. Uh, I'm sure there will be a significant <laughs> significance. Uh, I mean, um, we're experiencing it a lot in, in uh, the UK at the moment because of Brexit. And uh, we're experiencing sort of uh, a, a form of financial ruination. One of the things that um, is very interesting in Soane's work is that Soane's biggest commission was the Bank of England. And rather curiously, as he was constructing that building, he also depicted it in, in ruination and construction. Uh, and I think that's the, one of the things that's really crucial for me is that to emphasize when we talk about the term to ruin, we shouldn't just imagine it as going one way. We're also talking about a potential process of construction. It's embedded within the ruin. And then there is a follow up question. And I think we can come to like slowly to an end. So if there are any more questions after this, please let me know. Um, uh, Concerning one of the earliest questions and, and fragments, there it popped up, what is the very kind of the fragment? The very? Like what is the, the how would you define fragment in detail, I think? Um, there's there's a, one of the things that's very, I think it's Schlegel, the German romantic sort of poet, I think at the end of the 18th century, you know, I, I'll, I'll summarize, paraphrase what he said, but, but um, Basically, his argument was that um, in ancient history, um, the ancients created uh, whole forms that became ruins. And he said, in the modern world, we create uh, fragments that remain fragments. Uh, and one of the things, I, there's a number of reasons for that. I think that if you look at the early, um, the novels, certainly the early novels in the English language, um, they are all about fragmentation. Uh, and one of the very early novels that greatly inspired um, Soane is a, a novel by somebody called Lawrence Stern. It's called Tristram Shandy. And it's about the impossibility of about writing, uh, uh, encapsulating a life. And the narrator keeps trying to do a history of their life and sort of fails and, and has to keep starting again, but actually makes that process a creative and, and, and very enjoyable one. And I think it's sometimes said that the focus on the fragment came about because of um, modern society, basically, because uh, of a more mercantile society that emphasized the individual and gave, uh, and once there's a gr much greater emphasis to the individual, we start to focus in more inwardly and we start to see the fragmented nature of the self. So really that the fragment, I would say, it, it, uh, it doesn't have its origin in the ancient ruins. It has an origin in an 18th century sensibility, recognizing fragmentation and recognizing fragmentation as maybe synonymous with contemporary subjectivity, uh, which is both maybe a problem, but also a, a great uh, opportunity. The next question comes um, from Karina. Um, do you think we can plan the decay or do we simply have to accept it? Um, sometimes we can plan decay. Most of the times, of course, we can't. Uh, I, I think, you know, that the, what the situation we're in now is um, absolute indication of unpredictability on one level, because I don't think any of us would have expected had the last year that we've had, but at the same time, you know, we, we um, I was really amused to see that the uh, UK health minister in, in saying about some of the latest advice that he was going to advise, he said, it, because he'd been watching the film Contagion, the Hollywood film from a few years ago, and they had been in Contagion, they talked about the importance of having lots of vaccine available. And he said, this had emphasized to him how we must have lots of vaccinations in, in store. So yes, obviously there is a degree that you can predict decay, but often probably the real decay is the, that are going to be unexpected. They're not going to be the most obvious ones. 
And the next one by Zainab actually, I think, follows up a bit on this one or builds up on it. Um, first, you would like to thank once again for, for the great lecture. And a question um, is what, you've, what your thoughts are on graduality or the temporal aspects to a ruination or decay process, as you mentioned on the ruin as a changing stage, state or body. Can one orchestra, orchestrate a ruin, such in the case of Robert Smithson partially buried woodshed, the building that buries itself through time, or rather everything is a, in a constant ruination after it's designed or materialized? I, I think probably my answer would be quite similar to the previous question, where, yes, in some ways you can, and Smithson and many artists and architects have to a certain extent uh, predicted the decay and, and imagined decay. Uh, but then, uh, and some aspects of ruination decay, obviously you can't predict at all. One of the most interesting was um, when I was researching the University of Anglia buildings, um, Lasden, when he created those buildings in the 1960s, they were very pristine. Uh, 30 years later ago, ago, they were in an incredibly ruined state. The concrete uh, reinforcement bars had broken through the concrete. The lichens and moss had uh, accumulated on the surfaces. And this was actually what uh, Lasden wanted. He wanted the buildings to age and decay in that way. But maybe what was unpredictable was the way they decayed. And uh, there's a very interesting um, chemist of the atmosphere called Peter Brimblecombe, who's done a book called The Big Smoke, which is a history of polluted London. And he happened to be a professor at uh, University of Anglia. And I contacted him and said, you know, what was the cause of the, um, the, the excessive decay on these buildings and the accumulation of moss and lichen? And he said, well, actually, it had been a movement away from carbon dioxide emissions to nitrogen dioxide emissions. And actually, he said, because um, the University of Anglia is in quite a rural part of England, and it was the, um, the uh, agricultural fertilizers from, the, from industrial farming had actually created this very particular form of decay. So I think, for example, um, uh, Lansden might have been able to imagine the decay of his architecture, but he wouldn't have been able to see probably the eff effect of industrial farming on the, the surfaces of, the, of his buildings. And um, Kitam is asking, how do we increase importance of ruins and history in this digital world? Um, I think that ru maybe uh, ruins are, um, I'm probably not the person to answer that question because I don't think my knowledge of the digital is enough. I, I would ask my young Coletti. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would give a really good answer because I know that one of the things that my aunt's really interested in is all the glitches and anomalies in the digital. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I appreciate um, my aunt's work, you know, the way that he's interested in not what uh, a, a software program might be able to do, but what, what it can't do, what the, where the errors are. So he could probably very, talk very interestingly about that, I think. Um, another question by Giacomo, and I think maybe two or three more, and then we will slowly bring it to an end. Um, to what extent we can consider today's archaeology like the one of the 18th century? For example, Piranesi argues that he can reinvent Rome in the Campo Marzio because ancient Rome architecture is so various that one can invent anything still thinking to be coherent with the ancient. Today, archaeology works differently. As it has been institutionalized as a discipline, can we call archaeological today's need of working with the past or is it more speculative? It's interesting, isn't it? That you, you'd think that um, archaeology is, um, has become obviously more of a science. Uh, and therefore, you'd think it, it's further to some degree from the work of Piranesi. Uh, but one of my colleagues, um, uh, Ben Kamkin, who uh, is a professor at the Bartlett and who particularly focuses on um, issues of contemporary London and transformation of London, his first degree was actually partly in archaeology. 
And one time I was chatting to him and saying, you know, why he moved away from archaeology. And he said, oh, oh, because in archaeology, everything's speculative. Everything's ambiguous. You know, at least things are a little bit more certain in architecture. And I suppose that was not the answer that I expected. But you do sort of see it still when um, contemporary archaeologists talk about uh, archaeology. They talk, there's an amazing amount of ambiguity. You know, somewhere like Stonehenge, which is probably the most famous archaeological structure in, uh, uh, in Britain. Still, there's huge, nobody really knows why it was. And there are counter arguments by different archaeologists who've made their career arguing for what this building, what the structure might mean. I think there's also a very interesting aspect of uh, contemporary archaeologists where archaeologists are actually applying the tools of archaeology to the present. Uh, and there is somebody called Victor Buckley, who is at the, in the anthropology department of uh, UCL. Uh, and his background, he initially studied architecture, then he did a PhD in archaeology. And that's exactly what he applies, he, what he does. He applies archaeology to the present. And he's applied archaeology, archaeological techniques to contemporary architecture as well. And then by Sergio, he's asking, can you consider a parallel between Piranesi and Yole Ledoux as being, as being nemesis? What should be the current approach for architects, renation, restoration, and why? Well, it's very interesting you ask that because my knowledge of um, Via Ledoux uh, is increasing, I'm glad to say. Um, and, you know, I had a sort of general understanding of him, but um, one of my PhD students, Ashling O'Carroll, is actually has focused a lot on uh, Ville Le Doux. And, you know, Ville Le Doux is often seen as very much uh, the opposite of uh, Piranesi in the sense that he argue, uh, seemingly argues for the construction of an ideal uh, and looking just not architecture as a palimpsest, but going back in time and choosing one particular moment. But actually, uh, Ashling showing that uh, Ville Le Doux was, had a much more complex attitude to both to architecture and to uh, landscape. So if you're interested in that, I suggest you can Google her name. Uh, it's Ashling, it's A-I-S-L-I-N-G, and then O'Carroll. Uh, one of the things that she also brought up that I did not realize about Vila Du is the uh, sadly white su suprematist side to his argument that actually there, is, uh, there was an argument for uh, the, the purity of the Aryan uh, architecture. Uh, and I suppose, you know, he's a product of his century. He wasn't the only person arguing for such, uh, uh, arguing for such thoughts, but it does make you look at, uh, um, I don't think it means that Ville Le Doux is still not an interesting figure uh, to look at, but it certainly uh, makes him a very complicated figure. Indeed. And <clears throat> then one more by, by Andy. Um, if the architect is a historian twice over, isn't it a unique societal, societal and cultural responsibility? How are, how are we equipped to do this? Does that tie into what you said before about the development of architecture as a discipline? Um, I suppose it, it's an important thing, isn't it? How architects uh, speak really, and how they communicate. And I, I think it's a, it, it's a general cultural problem for architects um, that, that maybe they don't have the means to speak well, convincingly beyond their own, uh, beyond the profession. And architects um, tend to talk to each other, I think. And I do think it's part of a, a bigger cultural problem for architects and how that they can become, um, maybe more communicate beyond the profession, the ideas and values that they seem um, relevant. And if I, for example, was um, ever um, running an architecture school, if I chose to do that, one of the things that I would really emphasize would be uh, public speaking and the importance of public speaking. Because one of the things about, you know, an architect only gets a commission if they're persuasive. And many very skillful architects are also very skillful speakers. Uh, and I think it's um, certainly in architecture schools, you, you know, we emphasize the, the skills of 
uh, drawing, we have the skills of writing, but maybe the skill of speaking is, is one that we should all sort of more focus on. And then last but not least, um, the question by Maria, do you think documentary film or photography as tools to convey the importance and meaning of ruins? Can you name a documentary film or visual piece that you find relevant on the matter? Um, I suppose that any documentary, I can't think of any, one that immediately comes to mind, um, but I suppose a, any photograph um, only captures um, a building at a moment, moment in time. You could say that a film might be better at, at showing that, that, um, that translation, that transformation over time. That there is, I, I think, a real problem in the way that buildings are illustrated and in, in journals, online, in magazines. They are generally presented at a very in, the, in, in a pristine state in a very particular moment in time. They're generally shown without people. Uh, and it would be really interesting to, if I could think, I'll, I will try to think if I can think of an example to say that, but it would definitely be one that would depict uh, architecture over time in transformation, in construction, in, in ruination. And it might be one that showed a construction site possibly, because I think construction sites, as I mentioned, you know, I think they're, they're surprisingly similar to ruins. They're, they're about a change, they're about a process. And, and it's quite important, I think, to start thinking more and more about architecture as a process, as something always in a state of flux, as not something that is static and caught in a perfect moment. Thank you. Um, I think I should have them all. I uh, hope nobody has been overseen. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the great lecture and for answering all those many questions. Um, thanks the audience for listening and staying with us. Um, we see each other tomorrow at, at the seminar and hopefully all the others at our next lecture. Thank you. And thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. And I, I particularly enjoyed the questions, actually. Some really, it's always nice to get such interesting questions. And so I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.